Hey there, Dean Gastu here. Today's video is all about catching and cooking crabs and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. It's the Christmas holidays now, so I'm going to do a range of videos over the next coming weeks, set out on the water, doing some fishing, some boating, that kind of stuff. More than anything, just to give myself a break for the workshop. Obviously, it's quite hot at the moment in Australia, and the cicadas are going nuts, so I'll probably make some effort to filter them out, which might make the audio sound a bit strange for this video. Apologies for that. I recently bought these crab traps to replace some older style ones I had, so we'll start by going through rigging them up. When you buy them, they kind of come flat packed, so these upright PVC uprights just fold over, and all you need to do is stretch them up, hook the top ring into the loop here, and then just tie them off so they can't come undone again. There's an opening on the top here that's held closed by pulling this cord and hooking it on. This one has four entrances on the side, which is a reasonably tight sort of slit in the netting and sort of funnels in and out, and you've got that on each quarter. We'll be talking a bit about the regulations for catching crabs, and that obviously varies from region to region. Just because you can buy a crab trap in a region doesn't guarantee it's actually legal. In New South Wales, four openings is the maximum you can have in a crab trap, so these are legal here, but just be sure to sort of check your local rules. The first thing I do in rigging these up is get some buoys ready, because obviously you need a buoy so you can find the trap again. The regulations say the buoy needs to be at least 100 mil in diameter, and these ones are about 250. Now I'm going to be slightly overcomplicating things here because I use these boys to mark a variety of things. So all I've got is a short splice rope and a snap hook on the end and that way if I need to mark a spot for any other purpose I can use these boys. But for now we'll go through just how to mark them up as a crab trap boy and then I'll show you how I attach it to these traps. You can simplify it by simply having the line through a boy and that's all you use it for but this is what I've got. To give you a closer look, all I did was splice this sort of 12 mil rope through the hole in the centre of the buoy. And then I just spliced this snap hook on the other end. And that's what I'm running with. For me, it just makes this very versatile. It also gives you a little bit of weight on the end of the rope that helps pull it down as well. I bought these boys online, but I also found this little crab accessory kit, like this, which has some 100 mil boys, some bait holders, a marker pen, cable ties I've now dropped, and some cord. And it's got four boys, four sets of rope, and it was 25 bucks, so not too bad. This boy I marked last season with a permanent marker, and it's essentially blank. You can barely make out the writing on it. So what I'm gonna do now is actually engrave it with a soldering iron, just melt the writing into the boy a little bit, and then I'm going to use a black enamel paint to fill the groove up, and I'll see how well that lasts. I won't bore you with a huge dump of regulations, but I'll just talk you through each important bit as we do it. What we need to have, somewhat cryptically, is CT, crab trap, then first name, last name, then year of birth, and postcode. It's not too bad, but I'm doing this outdoors for a reason. I wouldn't breathe too much of this foam. Kind of ran out of room a little bit. As you can hopefully see there, it engraves quite nicely into this foam. So we'll do the other side. I've actually been following, more or less, the really light outline of the previous pen. If I was gonna do this from scratch, I'd definitely write it on pen first so you know it's gonna fit and then do your engraving. So next one on the other side, year of birth. So that's 1987. This soldering iron, by the way, is one I bought at a hardware store for like $9 or something. So just a real cheapie that I can use for this sort of job. Sorry, sweating like a pig today. This paint, I'm just guessing this. I've just got this enamel paint that I'm hoping is gonna stay. It's a bit of an experiment, but we'll see. Then I've just got one of these little brushes for models and things.
And there we go, finished product. So I'll get on and do the other one and then we'll pick up and start putting the lines onto the traps themselves. In case you're wondering, I'm doing these two boys because two is the maximum traps that one person can have in New South Wales. All right, they're both done now, so I'm gonna let them dry. A few finer points. Uh, the writing actually only has to be 15 millimeters tall to be compliant, so not very big at all, which makes sense to and try and fit it on a boy that size. And it has to be a contrasting color to the boy, so that's it. A few things, I guess, to note with the different boy size. I like the larger boys because they're much more visible. The smaller a boy is, the more chance that a boat's gonna run it over, particularly if it's in a little bit of chop. It doesn't take much to get this much wave height and suddenly these are pretty hard to see. This is the line I'm gonna to use to rig these traps up. I just bought it from Bunnings, so it wasn't very expensive, and it's essentially a polypropylene line, braided line, so it's nice to handle, but it is quite sort of rot and UV proof, that sort of thing. And this one's four millimeters thick. You can go a bit thinner, but I quite like four millimeters from the point of just handling the line. The simplest way to rig these up is just to tie a line, a single line, straight onto the top ring here. And that's fine. You know, when you lift the trap up, it'll sort of come up sideways. Anything that's in it will sort of fall into one of the corners and it's a pretty good way to go. Personally, I prefer to lift the trap vertically. So I'm going to put three lines onto the ring, have them meet at the central point and then go up from there. These three lines I'm gonna make no more than about a meter long. Now I've got three pieces roughly the same length. I'm just gonna melt the ends a little bit to stop them fraying. Easiest thing is to use a lighter for this. This lighter doesn't have any fluid in it, so I'm just gonna have a go with the soldering iron, see how it comes up. If you do a lot of work with synthetic ropes, one of the best things you can ever buy is one of those hot knives for cutting it and sealing it at the same time, but unfortunately that's in the workshop at the moment, so we'll make do. A knot I'm gonna use quite a lot doing these crab traps is an anchor bend. So I'll show you that one. An anchor bend is very similar to a round turn and two half hitches. The only real difference is that you do your round turns and this time you actually go through those turns and then come round and back out. So it's essentially a clove hitch onto the line with half of the clove hitch going through the round turns. And that's what I'm gonna to use to attach these three lines. Because I'm using three lines, I'm gonna put them 120 degrees apart so they're evenly spaced. Next thing is I'm just gonna gather the three ends, lift the trap so it's level. You can adjust the lines if you need to. And once they're all level, I'm just gonna tie a single overhand knot to start with. Now what I'm gonna do is attach these lines just to a stainless steel ring. These are a little bit small for my liking, but you get the idea. To attach this to the ring now, all I'm gonna do is treat all three as a single line and then just tie it on. I've done this one as a normal round turn and two half inches, just because I think it's a bit neater given the bulk of the line. And what I'm gonna do now is take all these tails and just do some whipping around it to keep them neat as well. We did a bit of whipping in a previous video, so I won't go through in detail, but I'll just show you the end result. Ring on, all three lines tied, and just the ends whipped down so they don't go sort of fluttering around everywhere. It's a little bit overcomplicated, I'll admit, but what it means now is I can pull this pot vertically out of the water, and if I change the depth of water I want to go crabbing in, I can swap the vertical line pretty easily by either tying it on or even having another small clip onto here. All right, I'm gonna do that again to the other one, then we'll start with the vertical line. I'll admit it did take a second beer, but I finally got these all rigged up now. What we need now is the vertical lines that go up to the buoy. Obviously the length of that line depends a lot on the depth of water you're gonna be looking to catch these crabs in. And from what I've read, about three to six meters is a good sort of range to be looking for. In the Hawkesbury here, we've got a tidal variation of two meters. So if you have six meters of line, drop in six meters at low tide, your crab trap's just gonna float away. This boy, particularly this larger boy, has got more than enough buoyancy to lift this off the bottom and send it on its merry way. So be really careful about that. So I'm gonna measure out about six meters of line. I've also got the three lines coming up from the trap and the line coming down from the boy, so that'll give me plenty of length. I'm just gonna tie it onto the ring from the up lines, just use a bow line or something. Should be nice and secure. At the other end, I'm gonna do another fisherman's bend onto a ring and I'll leave that as the top and that's what that snap hook on the float's gonna to attach to. What I'm gonna do now is take these 
crimp on lead weights like this and I'm going to crimp one onto the line every metre so that regardless of what depth of water I put the line in, it's not going to float along the surface. Having it float along the surface means there's a much greater chance that a boat's going to pick the line up. The person in the boat's going to end up with a rope around the prop and you're going to end up losing your crab trap. So, you know, nobody wins. The way the regulations read, they say you have to have a 50 gram weight no less than a metre below the buoy. So the idea there is that the rope's at least a metre below the water, so boats with a metre draft won't pick it up, and it doesn't matter so much if the rope billows deeper than that. With this system, I'm going to be clipping my buoy onto the line. So I've already got the weight of the shackle and the ring here, which is approximately a metre deep anyway. So these little weights really are just about keeping this line on the bottom as much as possible. So once I've got a bit of a gap, I just push it on, then I'm just going to use some bull nose pliers to clamp it down onto the line. Then I'm just going to keep repeating that process heading up towards the buoy. It's probably fair to say I've over-engineered these because I use the components individually sometimes. If you want to do a quick and dirty sort of simple setup, all you really need is one anchor bend onto the top hoop of the trap itself. Then you can just come up through a small buoy like this, take a loop through it, and then you can tie it off any way you want really, which just keeps the buoy in a certain position. And then at this end, you can do a bit of a bowline or something with a large hoop. And that also gives you a bit of a handle for pulling it up from. Then the only thing you really need is the weight on the line to stop it floating. So if you're looking for a real sort of quick and dirty get in the water as fast as you can, this is the kind of setup I'd go with. When you're baiting the crab pot, the most important thing is you secure the bait itself to the base of the trap. You can get these bait clips, essentially you just sort of spike through it, hook through the net, clip it on, or you can use some long cable ties. I kind of like these because they're reusable, whereas the cable ties are a bit more disposable, the world doesn't really need more plastic, you know, so both are good ways to go though. All right, let's pack up here and head down to the water. To get these ready to bait, all I'm gonna do is just loop all this line up so it doesn't get tangled, which is particularly important when you actually go to throw it out. But it also clears it out of the way for opening the trap up. Then I've got this hook undone, which gives me good access to the inside of the trap. For bait today, I'm gonna to be using a couple of salmon heads. With these clips, I'm just gonna put the base part through the net, hook it through somewhere in the centre of the base and then have the hook come up and as gory as it seems through the eyes is the best way to actually secure a, a fish head like this and then just clip it on. So we'll do the same thing for the other one and then we'll chuck them in the water. Once we've got the bait in we just need to draw it closed and then hook the hook on the frame just to keep the top section closed. When you're looking to drop the pots, you're looking for a sandy or a muddy bottom between three and six meters deep. So use your sounder if you got it, but also when you drop it in, just lower it. You'll feel when it hits the bottom. And if you don't have enough slack in the rope for the tidal variation, then go and find somewhere a bit shallower. The regulations also say you're not allowed to have your two traps within two or three metres of each other, so we'll move a little bit and drop the other one. It's best to check the pots every hour or two, that way crabs can't get in and get out again. And also if you catch something other than a crab, it gives you a chance to release it before it dies. So now, go for a fish, go for a swim, whatever, come back in an hour or so. We're back at the crab pots now, it's been about two hours, so we'll lift them up and have a check. Before we do that though, I'm going to prepare a bit of an ice slurry because if there are crabs in there, I like to just put them straight onto ice because that sort of sedates them before we get them home and start handling them.
then to about a third of an SV of river water. Just add that ice. So this one's a little sand crab, which I'm not going to eat. And you can see here, you can tell from the back here whether they're male or female. If they're broader, they're female, and they're narrow, they're male. And there'll be row under there too. So if a female's in row, definitely throw that back. So this one will pop back, and then we'll put this trap back and hopefully find some blue swimmers. This time I've managed to end up with an eel and two crabs. Oh, now they're having a go at each other. Our remaining crab is a female blue swimmer. It's thrown both its claws, which can happen with damage in a net, so that's one of the downsides of these sorts of nets. Uh, but they do actually grow back. The upside to this for us is it means it's very safe and easy to handle, so I'll actually pull her out, show you the distinctive features of a female, and then we'll pop her back in the water because you've already lost the claws and you can't eat dead crab meat. It has to be sort of either frozen straight away, killed and then cooked straight away. And, you know, it just means she can go back, regrow cores, they bolt, they basically throw their shell and so the process starts again as they grow. But before we do that, I'll give you a quick look. So females are a darker sort of brown colour compared to the blue of the males. The most distinctive thing is they have this wide section underneath here, which is where the row is. So if you see a female in row, you definitely throw them back. I'm going to throw this one back anyway because of the claw situation and it's not huge. I think it is legal though. So the measuring size is six centimetres front to back this way. But you can go back. Another really good source of bait for crab traps is fish frames from fish and chip shops. So if you go to a fish and chip shop where they actually fill up their own fish, they'll have these frames and more than likely be happy to give them to you. So if you go and ask them, they can keep some for you or whatever. So I'm now going to put this fish frame into this trap because that salmon head's been in the water for a little while, just to keep it fresh. You can actually load a trap up with a fair bit of bait if you want. It doesn't hurt. The more the merrier. Because I left the rest of these clips up at the house, I've just put a cable tie here, cable tie here to keep it on the bottom. Oh, here we go. Couple in this one, three. So this one's quite brown, so I think it's a female blue swimmer. Then there's a small blue swimmer here, and then a bigger blue swimmer over there. So, got a few this time. The easiest way to go with crabs is to tip them straight into the esky, into the ice slurry. But it gets a little bit trickier when you're um, trying to keep some and get rid of others. So I might use the towel. I'll just show you underneath the net, it's probably going to be the easiest way, is this female also is in row. So I'll show you that. So hopefully you can see there's a whole lot of eggs under that female. The way I'm going to deal with this is just grab the larger male out, pop him in the esky, in the ice water, and then I'm just gonna tip the net upside down overboard and let the smaller male and the female go. As we had before, she's kind of hanging on with her claw, but if I drop the net in the water, she'll let go. All right, well that's one good crab in that trap, so we'll go check the other. There's also a legal sized male in this one, so we'll keep the two of them. Because there's just the one, it's nice and easy, you can just tip it straight in the esky. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it helps you if you sort of plan to head out and do some crabbing this summer. Take care, bon appetit, and I'll see you soon. Bye.